Well, I think that uh, there are many lessons from the uh, what happened in Chile in 1970 to 73 and the coup. Uh, one thing that uh, it, that came out uh, from it was how uh, completely criminal and terrorist the U.S. government's role was in what happened. And from the very beginning of the Allende, even before Allende took power, or not power really, he took office, and that's an important distinction. But um, the U.S. was trying, to, Nixon and Kissinger uh, were trying to overthrow or uh, get the military to intervene to prevent Allende, who had won the election of 1970, from taking power. And uh, we can never forget that uh, the words of, of Nixon, which were to, he was going to make the economy scream. In other words, he was going to inflict as much damage on the Chilean economy as possible in order to bring about an overturn of the government. And that making the economy scream, um, of course, did contribute with the strikes that would later happen, so-called strikes by doctors and, and uh, truck owners and, and others from the middle class and upper middle class. Uh, that caused great suffering among the population and helped open the way. Uh, the lesson of uh, the uh, of uh, the continuing importance of understanding the relationship between the state and revolution is really uh, a, a one that the Chilean people paid for. This lesson paid for uh, with a great deal of blood and suffering. Uh, and it's one which we, as who aspire to be revolutionaries in the United States, uh, have to remember, have to keep in mind, um, and that that the the state that as it presently exists is it not reformable. It has to be replaced, and it has to be replaced by uh, a revolutionary government, a, a revolutionary state. So. Uh, and, you know, for uh, I think that that understanding of what uh, of, of the real meaning of state and revolution was brought to uh, millions of people around the world in a very negative way and seeing how if the relationship that relationship between the state and revolution is not understood, uh, the disasters that could unfold. But I think most of all, what we want to do is express our solidarity with the people of Chile who are continuing uh, to fight for a decent life for themselves, for their families, for their communities, uh, and to get out from under the heel of U.S. imperialism and its, and its allies in Latin America. Uh, we hope and believe that there will be a revival of the, of the movement in Chile as there will be everywhere and as there already has been and a number of countries in Latin America. And so uh, it's important, and this is the 50th anniversary of the, of the, uh, the military coup in Chile, uh, to remember those lessons, and above all, to, uh, to emphasize the need for solidarity, of international solidarity, uh, particularly uh, toward the people of Chile coming from the United States, which is the main source, really, of the problems that the Chilean people and people of Latin America continue to face down till today. Thank you so much, Richard, for talking to us today. This interview is part of the activities that we will be doing during the month of September to commemorate the 50 year of the coup. Thank you so much for, for sharing all of your reflections. Thank you. Yes, this was really interesting and a lot of things that were connected at the world level, at the imperialist level, at the local level, in the US, in Chile, and the solidarity around the world. And we wanted to close just reminding that in the Party for Socialism and Liberation, this uh, is an interview that has been done uh, for the Party for Socialism and Liberation. We revive multiple revolutionary traditions to build a path towards socialism in the U.S. during our lifetime. And today we brought the experience of the Chilean UP and the MIR, and we really thank you, Richard, for making this happen so we can actually connect uh, these struggles in a more uh, systematic and strategic and historical way. So thank you very much.
September 11th marks the 50th year of the coup d'etat in Chile that overthrew socialist president Salvador Allende. He was the first president elected with a socialist program in the world and governed the country between 1970 and 1973. Today, we'll talk about how the Chilean path towards socialism and the dictatorship was experienced among in the U.S. with Richard Becker. Welcome and thank you for joining Carla and me, Link, for today. To start, thank you very much. Oh. Thank you, Richard. <laughs> to start, can you share what did the left and social movements in the U.S. think about Salvador Allende's government and the construction of socialism in Chile during that time? Well, uh, in the early 1970s, there was a revival of the socialist movement, socialist and communist movements in the United States, really as an outgrowth of the uh, Black Liberation Movement and uh, especially the Vietnam War, uh, which radicalized hundreds of thousands of people and also uh, brought a revival of the interest in the socialist movements, the struggles for socialism, in many countries in the world, and particularly, I would say, in Chile, uh, because Chile was became a focal point of the hopes of not only the people of Chile, but the people of all, uh, all of Latin America, that there would be another uh, socialist uh, country that would come into being, and so that Cuba would not be so isolated in, in Latin America. So, uh, this was uh, a period when there was a revival. There wasn't the kind of movement that uh, mass movement that there was because of the Vietnam War, but because but of course there were not U.S. troops, uh, at least openly sent in, into Chile and to other parts of Latin America. But it was a very important. Uh, from speaking for myself personally, uh, I followed in the early 1970s, uh, especially starting in 1972 the developments in Chile uh, and uh, and paid a great deal of attention. And, you know, for, uh, really, uh, we viewed, we understood what happened in Chile as uh, in, in a way that we had never understood the issue of state and revolution before, uh, at a, of course, at a tremendous cost and tremendous price that was paid by the Chilean people. And before the coup d'etat, what did you know about the Marxist political parties in Chile? Well, began, I began to know more about it, as I said, in 1972. And, uh, and the popular unity made up of the Communist Party, of the Socialist Party, which is really not one Socialist Party, but a number of Socialist Parties uh, or, or factions of the Socialist Party. And I believe also the Radical Party. Uh, and uh, understood them as having an approach to socialism and to the construction of socialism through the electoral process. And also came to know of the MIR, the movement of the revolutionary left, which had uh, uh, both supported uh, against, uh, against counter-revolution and against the right wing, the popular unity government but was not part of the popular unity, unity government and which had a more radical position called for arming the masses uh, and called for the, you know, the radical uh, transformation of uh, Chile beyond the program of the uh, popular unity government. That's really interesting. And how, because like in 72, also there was the moment of the, if you want like the big year in which the, the landowners, the big capitalists who went against the government, they did a big strike in October. So it was a moment in which the, the contradictions within the popular unity and, the, and the, the criticism were pretty high in a high level at that point. So I'm wondering, how did you knew, how did you know about them at that point, like through news or there were some comrades that were traveling here or, you know, people from the U.S., or from Chile going to the U.S.? A radio, 
Uh, yeah, how did you know if you can tell us a little more about well, that? Well, I, I became acquainted then with literature in the United States. Uh, I was uh, I joined a youth organization called Youth Against War and Fascism. Uh, it was uh, the youth organization of uh, Workers' World Party, uh, which was a very dynamic party at that time and which was uh, a very much aligned with the Mir in terms of its political thinking. Uh, and also uh, with the Revolutionary Workers' Party <clears throat> of Argentina. Uh, and and uh, I, I think that all shared a common view at that time, a uh, common worldview in many ways. Uh, and also uh, the, uh, had a, a, a view of the, uh, the popular unity government and, its, and the relationship of the mayor to the popular unity government uh, that conformed uh, more or less with the Mir's viewpoint to the extent that we knew, because of course, being thousands of miles away, uh, we can only know so much in reality. And talking about, yeah. oh, go ahead. Go. Go yeah, ahead. No, go ahead, go ahead, go ahead, go ahead. Talking about the period after the popular unity years, uh, when the coup happened, can you share with us how was the dictatorship uh, years lived among revolutionaries in the U.S.? Well, particularly in the 1970s, I lived in Rochester, New York, which is a medium-sized industrial city in western New York, and where there was... Uh, uh, there, there was a Latin American uh, solidarity movement, mainly based in the Puerto Rican community, uh, and which was, you know, uh, we followed there the developments in Chile um, and had forums about it and, and so forth. But San Francisco, where I moved to in 1981, was much more a center of the Chilean rep, uh, community in exile. Uh, and uh, people who had been support, mainly, mainly it was from people who were supporters of the Mir. Many of them had been tortured and exiled, uh, as many of the members of the Mir were, and many of the members of all the left parties and the unions and the workers and so forth. But they came to Berkeley, California, which is uh, right across the San Francisco Bay from San Francisco, and established something called La Peña. And La Peña was, they called it their Vietnam project. Uh, it was a very nice center. And it was a center that became a center of political act, uh, activism for all different kinds of organizations, uh, left organizations uh, and community organizations. But it also had within it, the core was an organization called Casa Chile. And Casa Chile was uh, the, the, the political organization uh, that continued to carry on throughout the 1980s, especially, and into the 1990s, uh, uh, movements, uh, 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 events that would take place on September 11th every year, on the anniversary of the coup, uh, and other actions in solidarity with the people's movement in Chile. So it was a very, it was a very important uh, center of the entire left movement, which was quite large then in the in the Bay Area. Yeah, and well, that's really interesting because actually, yeah, yeah, I was thinking also the type of, because there were also like these unity moments after the coup d'etat in Chile, because of after the coup, before the coup, the divisions were high, but then uh, they had to help each other somehow, still the criticism. But I was wondering, you named in between the Puerto Rican community and the Chilean community. I know that the MIR was, the MIR was pretty close, it seems, with the PSP, the party for uh, social, or the Socialist Party of Puerto Rico and the independence struggle. So, yeah, I don't know if you have any memories around that. And also, like, how did you think or how you think about the strategies, you know, like PSP, MIR, uh, Walker's World at that point, like, because before you were saying that they were kind of similar with Argentina, too. Uh, yeah, if you can deepen more on that, that would be amazing. Well, <clears throat> yes, it was very important. As far as the first part, um, the 
uh, in in uh, Rochester, New York, where I was, the Puerto Rican community they were not organized in the in the uh, uh, PSP, the Puerto Rican Socialist Party, but they were uh, very much in uh, in support of uh, Chile and uh, and and like you said about the unity that developed certainly and that was certainly appropriate. There have been big differences in Chile uh, leading up to the time of the coup. Um, but once people were in exile among the left group, there was a lot of collaboration uh, between, as at least to what we could see, particularly here in California. So the people who came from Socialist Party, who came from Communist Party, uh, came from the MIR. The MIR was the strongest organized group here uh, in, in California. Uh, but uh, I, I think that it, there was an understanding of the need for unity against the repression that was going on in Chile and against the fascist uh, uh, Pinochet government. And so uh, that was that was important. And as far as the uh, the relationship, the political unity, uh, I, the political basis of unity that existed uh, between the workers world and the and the um, uh, the PRT in Argentina and the MIR in Chile, it was a common worldview about the class struggle, about the, I don't know if what, everyone would have put it that way, but the global the global class struggle and who was on which side. And, uh, and uh, also in terms of practical work, after the coup in Argentina, uh, the whole Southern Cone was under fascistic military dictatorships. And um, there was the Jota uh, Seere, the uh, JC, JCR, which was the Junta of Revolutionary Coordination, so that there was an, an attempt that was made to, uh, to have unified action uh, between the movements, uh, the, the revolutionary left movements in the Southern Cone in particular, um, and uh, there were some publications that were made by in the United States of their documents that went out. Uh, they, of course, were pretty much crushed by Operation uh, uh, Condor. Uh, and Oper uh, Operation Condor, which was really the CIA directed, uh, but it included the DINA of Chile and the secret police of Argentina and Uruguay and Paraguay. Um, and and they worked together to uh, to crush the the left parties um, that were then in exile and or living under uh, military dictatorship. That's so interesting. Um, with the JCR, could you share a little more about how, specifically in regards to um, the the Mir's involvement in in the U.S. Um, in in that coordination, um, and how did that look like? I honestly don't know a great deal about it. What I know is mm -hmm. I saw the documents, and the and there would be documents that would be published periodically uh, that reflected analysis of the situation in the different countries that were living under the dictatorships, uh, and um, and so there was the you know that sharing of information and analysis, which was very important. Um, I don't actually know when it ceased to exist as a functioning organization, but I do know that there was a great deal of repression that was directed, uh, and it was directed not only against the uh, revolutionaries, but the, the revolutionary movements, but also other movements that had been part of uh, uh, part of the popular unity government, like uh, the murder of Orlando Letelier, and Ronnie Moffat in Washington, D.C. by car bomb that was an operation carried out by the DINA, the Chilean secret police, in collaboration, of course, with the CIA. And just a follow-up question also, I was thinking about um, the comrades from Chile that came to the U.S. that were exiled and I don't know how was your experience with them, if, if if from what they were able to share about what was happening in Chile and like uh, if you saw anything that, you know, stood out to you in those like 
conversations um, in regards to the, the the political situation in Chile? Mm -hmm. Well, um, particularly, I was the in the 1970s. Of course, was extremely difficult for anything to any kind of action in the mid 1980s, early to mid 1980s. There began to be a revival of the movement inside the U.S., but still, I mean, inside Chile, but. Uh, under conditions that were so extremely difficult uh, for people to to be able to participate in any ways. So um, there would be at different times, you know, there would be act actions here uh, in solidarity with, um, say, mass movements that developed in Chile uh, and, you know, the hopes that for an end to the dictatorship and hoping to be part of the international movement seeking to be part of the international movement that was in solidarity with those who are fighting to end the dictatorship uh, and, uh, and, and and military rule. And now I, we wanted to ask you uh, to a more personal level, if you want like the individuals that you've met, uh, that you met in those times, both in the 70s and then in the 80s, uh, what do you remember about them? Like, or if you could characterize somehow whatever you have in your mind about the type of cadre that the Mir was building or the PRT uh, in Argentina or even the you all, like the group in the Workers' World Party uh, of that time, like how, how would you describe uh, the different types of cadre or more in the individual subjective level, if you want? Yeah. Well, in particular, with the um, there were very few in the 1970s. There were very few. There was only one person really who had been he had been in prison and tortured, and he he came to Rochester and he became an active active there. But he was very traumatized, really. And we I I remember a very dramatic thing that happened. We had a forum about Chile, and um, in the forum he was speaking and he collapsed. He just collapsed, he fell to the floor. Uh, and, you know, I think that a lot of people who had been through these horrible, horrible experiences uh, at, at the, the torture at the hands of the secret police and the, the prisons, you know, they, they suffered a lot. In California, there were many more people and they, we were very good friends and collaborators. And they were, they were uh, we thought, wonderful people, you know, wonderful organizers, and very dedicated, um, and and this was uh, particularly in, after we uh, moved to California, where I moved to California in 1981, and in the period that followed, the Casa Chile and and ourselves uh, worked very closely together, and we had very high, uh, very very excellent uh, impression, and of course, you know, it was very very painful for. Everyone, of course, for the Chilean people, most of all, but the death of Miguel Enriquez, uh, the loss of Miguel Enriquez in the 1970s, I remember very clearly, you know, like that and and just knowing what the comrades there were suffering and, and going through. Um, that was, uh, you know, it, it had a very big impression. And, and uh, you know, it was during that period, like I said, that you know, he really came to dramatically understand, graphically understand what it meant to come close to revolution, but not to succeed. I think that you could say that about the Chile was in a revolutionary period. If the bourgeoisie is, is frightened, but they are not crushed, then they will come back and inflict a thousand times as much, uh, as much suffering on the masses. And particularly on the revolutionaries, and so that's something that you know we and and understanding really understanding from the what happened in Chile, what state and revolution really means, the real meaning of it, and how that the revolution has to conquer, or the revolution you know and, and has to have the tactics. The party, the revolutionary party, has to have the tactics that can bring about. Uh, can can lead out of the revolutionary crisis to the revolution itself, to this overturning and this, and defeat of the bourgeoisie. Uh, how uh, you know that the fact that that did not happen in Chile 
and this the extreme uh, suffering of the people there and what a setback it was for the people of Latin America and the people of the world. Uh, that was very uh, dramatically, I think, understood by many people here and around the world, and particularly young people. Uh, we were we were very young people at that time, and you know some of those concepts like state and revolution were somewhat abstract. And in understanding and trying to follow very closely, which we did, the events in Chile in 72 and 73, um, we came to understand it in you know, a way we never did before. Well, yeah. Yeah, here in Chile, there is the... Um... There is this kind of secrecy that people don't talk actually what you were describing about the, the trauma of the dictatorship and the cost of actually losing and not conquering power, like the state and revolution problem. And here in Chile, it's like now silenced. So we don't talk anymore about that uh, too much. Uh, not even about the tortures. The people don't talk about the with their families about what happened with them. They don't talk with their friends. So every big upsurge, during every big upsurge, let's say 2019 or 2011, you have like more people talking about the things that have happened, but there is like a big silence that will remain we probably because of the difficulties of speaking about that. So somehow that also lost the strategy, if you want, from the strategy of the 60s and 70s, we don't talk about that neither. So I wanted to ask you like, how how it continued the history you were talking about the 70s the 80s what happened after like after the big defeat if you want when because in the 80s we believed and the mirror that we could came back that we could come back to the to power or to the idea of a socialist strategy however then in the 90s 2000s all of that disappeared in the chilean context so uh, how will you narrate or or, or or explain your relation if you want with with Chile and what happened after the 80s. Yeah. Well, there's a lot to be said about that, of course. But I think, you know, on the one hand, people don't talk. I mean, I I have worked a great deal in the with the Palestinian movement over uh, since the 1980s, early 1980s. And, you know, people who are arrested or subject to torture, they don't want to talk about it. You know, they they. Uh, it's it's very obviously very very traumatic and and very hard and so uh that and and we certainly understand that about the political question about what happened over you know the decades i i think that you know when there are defeats and setbacks that every movement suffers but there are also world historic setbacks and a world historic setback is when but it's not easy to recover from. Uh, it may take it may take a long time, and it may actually have to uh, go through a period. and And I think this has been has uh, there's a number of examples of this. Is that uh, when a revolutionary movement is defeated, uh, then there the, the the and the many the survivors are forced into exile. They continue to organize and. Uh, and activate for some period of time afterwards, but then it can, it can be seem so far away. It can seem like well, the hopes for revival didn't come about in the '70s and particularly in the '80s, and the hopes of a you know 